Nothing on this video or channel should be considered as financial advice. I have a bias towards the XX network because they are sponsors of the show. There are no private lives. This is a most important aspect of modern life. One of the biggest transformations we have seen in our society is the diminution of the sphere of the private. We must reasonably now all regard the facts that there are no secrets and nothing is private. Everything is public. You know, this history of looking into people's bank accounts is quite new. Traditionally, and again, Burke remembers this, that gentlemen did not want to, uh, the gentlemen didn't read other gentlemen's mail, and they didn't look into their bank accounts. That was considered privacy. And actually, from the time of the Magna Carta and our Anglo-Saxon tradition, we had this concept of privacy. And governments had not had the authority, generally, to look into people's bank accounts. That changed in 1933. Hitler's Germany was the first, was the first country to put down a law to deny financial privacy. It was a decree made by Hitler in 1933 called for the protection of the state and the individual, for your protection. Doesn't this sound sort of familiar? And, and so this gave the German government the right to look at everybody's bank account. And this is the thing that caused a lot of Germans, particularly German Jews, to move their money out of Germany to Switzerland and other places to try to hide it from the authorities because it was setting up procedure. Banking has intertwined with the government. Banking laws have become more and more intrusive. They want to know everything about you and you sign away your privacy because you can't live without a bank account. Just recently, Kanye West was debanked from JP Morgan for spreading misinformation. PayPal, quote, accidentally added to their terms of service a $2,500 fine for misinformation. These controls are already in place. One thing that we really care about is privacy. And privacy, I think, has been, um, I mean, they are countries in Europe which have suffered from lack of privacy. And these countries are particularly attached to their privacy. But second, I think there have been enough scandals in the last few years of companies that have collected data through payments, notably, and otherwise, and that have uh, monetized those data by selling databases, by producing artificially intelligence produced uh, in-depth analysis of you, me, and others, and they don't want that. So, you know, I think it's in addition to being the sort of central bank guaranteed digital banknote, it's also a, a, a digital payment that should be available if people want it. You know, if, if, if Europeans don't want it, then we shouldn't go there. But we should be ready if they want it. Because we provide the guarantee that those data will never be exploited for commercial purposes. Whether people pay to buy their bread, or they pay to buy their cars, or what kind of uh, medicine they purchase, what kind of frequency they go to hospital, is none of our business as central banks. It can be the business of private sector data collectors who happen to find out lots of interesting things about us. This is not the business of a central bank, and it, it, it should never be. Europeans are more concerned with privacy versus the U.S. because of World War II, because of Communist East Germany. This intrusion of privacy has hyperbolic consequences. The U.S. gave birth to tech giants and we grew up on social media, so we're desensitized to a lack of privacy. Now money or CBDCs are going to be true and we'll move to a true cashless society. Europe needs to lead on privacy regulations and the digital euro needs privacy on a foundational level in case in the future someone can reveal all previous transactions. For abortion access affect your digital privacy. So currently, tech companies like Google store historical location data from portable devices. So that means the data could be subpoenaed in court proceedings or even leaked putting visitors of abortion clinics in danger. In response to the ruling Friday, President Biden said this is about a woman's privacy. But extremist governors and state legislators are looking to block the mail 
or search a person's medicine cabinet or control a woman's actions by tracking data on her apps she uses are wrong and extreme and out of touch. Kanye West and PayPal might align with your political beliefs, or maybe not, but the problem isn't one side or another. The centralized system has grown to a point where all the mechanisms are in place. The pendulum will swing left to right. Each time it swings, it goes a little further and further. We're at a point where mainstream media has news reports on which extremist group is more violent. Imagine if doctors were able to prove their credentials without revealing who they are. If they could speak against the status quo, they could reveal their true opinions on topics without worry of penalties. Well, once you've got it all, collected it all, stored it all, you still have to go through it all. So that's why they built this. Uh, they're, they're actually in the process. I think they'll finish it in the next year or so. They're building this enormous computer um, down in uh, Tennessee at the Oak Ridge National Lab. That's the same place that they built the uh, uh, some of the nuclear or atomic weapons, <laughs> excuse me, back in World War II. Um, and uh, they, the idea here is to get the computer to get up to exaflop speed, which is an enormous speed, a quintillion operations a second, billion, billion operations a second. So, The NSA stores everything that happens on the Internet. In Utah, they built one of the largest data centers in the world. There is so much data that it is difficult to use. This is one of the promises of AI. AI recognizes p patterns within data and extracts and distills the information. For many people, the assumption is that these mechanisms don't make mistakes. And that is very far from the truth. The way AI works is it's trained. Ever go to a CAPTCHA site where they want you to click three images of a fire hydrant? That's training the AI. When we get into financial data, the AI will be making some of the most important decisions of our lives. Our mortgage rate, if we're qualified to buy a home, your job, if you should get a loan. Yet these decisions are being made by an AI that isn't perfect. Even in the case of what law enforcement can't get or would say require a warrant to get, often they can just ask or buy that from particular companies. For example, a report came out in May showing that ICE is buying tons of information from data brokers to create a massive surveillance system. It can point at almost anyone in the country with basically no oversight. And it's not just data brokers. All sorts of powerful companies and government agencies are buying and using data in ways we didn't agree to or really envision. There is an argument that stable coins will replace the need for a CBDC in the U.S., and that's a valid argument. Stable coin providers need to adhere to the banking laws, and with most crypto assets, all transactions are public. This would give government agencies the opportunity to look at data without the need for a warrant, because all of this information is public. If I know your wallet address, I know every transaction. And equally important, this executive order protects patient privacy and access to information which looking at the press assembled before me probably know more about it than I do. I'm not a tech guy. I'm learning. But right now, when you use a search engine or the app on your phone, companies collect your data. They sell it to other companies, or they even share it with law enforcement. There's an increasing concern that extremist governors and others will try to get that data off of your phone, which is out there in the ether, to find what you're seeking where you're going, and what you're doing with regard to your health care. Talk about no privacy. No privacy in the Constitution. There's no privacy. Period. The critique of privacy-enabled networks or privacy coins is they'll never allow it, and that's a valid criticism. But there are use cases that would fall into line with existing laws. Medical is one. A doctor could set up their whole communications, billing, records, and data storage on a better tech like the XX network. Actually, the important part of, about this, and it is incredibly difficult to do, right? Um, the international sense financial system in all of its glory is very well designed for sanctions evasion. Um, and if, if you want to launder money, there is someone who will tell you how to do it really well, and it, will prob and it may very well be out of the a reach of, um, of, a, of any author of an official authority or a bank that's trying to look for it. And so that is, again, that is the long-term burn on making sure that these things are effective on the sort of a compliance side. Um, on, um, I do think that there are, um, 
there, there is a lot of there is value to occasionally posing a large deterring fine um, um, on an, on a financial institution or a firm that has a sort of um, wittingly um, evaded sanctions and gone uh, and gone to great lengths to um, to obfuscate the source of funds in order to complete a transaction or a deal that is counter to the government it, it, it domiciles right. Um, although I, but I do think it also, um, on the other side, does harbor resentment, um, especially when you know when when the U.S. government does it. You know, c- c- countries think we're doing this not because um, we sign on to the ideology of it or to comply with it, but just because those um, you know those 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 angry Americans or angry whomever are going to come after us if we do it otherwise. And I think that sometimes overmines the sort of beneficent, sort of benevolent will to, to comply with sanctions, even if it's on a country like uh, a country like Russia. Even with all the red tape, shell companies are created and served by the banking community. The friction and cost of compliance is passed on to the consumer. I recently signed up to a crypto exchange and it's been over a week long and I still haven't gotten accepted. I've pretty much sent all of my sensitive information to the exchange that is using an encryption service for the data. This whole process could be built on the XX network, and a group of exchanges could use the same KYC company where I receive a private ID as an NFT, and I could prove myself without going through the whole process for each exchange. All the KYC stuff has been done, and it's been proven in the ID that they accept. Uh, I got sort of fed up with listening to their arguments of how we can't have anonymity. And they usually say because you have increases tax evasion and money laundering and drug dealing. So I looked up the data. Last year, 932 individuals were convicted of money laundering in the U.S. 932. Our population is 270 million. We had 18,000 murders. Now, how many of those people were killed because somebody was trying to take somebody else's this stuff? Good share of those. We had several million robberies, several tens of millions of thefts. Most of it was trying to get this stuff. If you go to a digital world, you greatly reduce the opportunities for crime. The convenience stores, the all-night convenience stores, the gas station, banks, and so forth, which are prone to having people come with guns to hold them up. If there's no money there, what are you going to steal? Now, you can steal somebody's smart card, but you can have any degree of security you want on a smart card. You can have them, so if somebody steals it, they can use it. Or you can put have a, a pin code or a thumbprint or a voice print or a, a facial profiles, all kinds of things you can do with them. Uh, if you whatever level of security you want. Right now, it's a whole week of me going back and forth with the exchange trying to get them the proper documents, and I'm not even doing anything wrong. And the government solution is this massive dragnet surveillance on everyone. I have to spend my time and energy scanning documents and sending it to the exchange. The exchange has to hire teams of professionals to look through my documents, and for what? This speech was taken in 99, but the data still holds up. It's actually decreased. It's only 831 people that were convicted of money laundering in the U.S. That's a 23.5% decrease since 2017. The uh, success rate, the NSA first came out and they said, um, well, look, uh, we've had uh, 54 successes here. We've been able to stop 54 terrorist events. Uh, the problem is by the time they got to holding their hand up and uh, swearing under oath the truth, uh, it didn't really come down to that. It came down to one incident, and that was the, um, this taxi driver in San Diego uh, that they found was sending $8,000 to some group in Somalia. And that's the one success that they had uh, in all that collection of metadata for the la- ever since 2011, the billions and billions and billions of communications they're collecting every time you make a phone call. Uh, but they're still collecting it. Um, they're not, uh, the, there's been a move in Congress to try to end the uh, collection of that metadata, but it hasn't gone very far, and uh, they're still collecting it, even though it's virtually useless. 
The governments have collected all of our data. Banks have all of our sensitive information. These are targets for hackers. It's not like we can audit their encryption standards. In Australia, a telecommunications network called Optus was just recently hacked. If you're an Optus customer, all of your information was stolen and it's your headache. You're the one that's got to change your driver's license and social security number, yet who is liable? Why do they even need this information? We have something called the Bank Secrecy Act passed in 1970. But in typical Washington fashion, the Bank Secrecy Act is actually the anti-bank secrecy act because it forces your banker to spy upon you. It prohibits banks from giving bank secrecy, even though it's called the Bank Secrecy Act. And originally, um, they had a limit of $10,000 in cash transaction, and there was these currency transaction reports the banks had to file, and that was in 1970, would be, what, $40,000 today, but they kept lowering the level, and they made it five and down to three, and then David talked about the um, Know Your Customer regs, which is going to bring it down to zero. When I was doing the book, I went around and talked to a number of bank compliance officers, or big banks, and they were talking about the huge cost of having to train all their personnel to look for suspicious activities. You know, David, let's say he normally takes uh, $100 of cash out a week for spending cash up a checking account. Suddenly, one week, David goes in and puts, takes out $300. Aha! A suspicious activity. A report goes to Washington. And if the banks don't do that, they're fine. It's a huge burden. So I started looking at the cost of this for the whole banking system. What well, ran into hundreds of billions of dollars. And then I looked at the number of convictions. Now, I calculated that the convictions seem to cost more than $100 million when you look per conviction if you look at the total public and private sector cost. And everybody was screaming about Ken Starr spending $44 million and he got 17 convictions. Well, FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, is out there, and their, I think their uh, numbers are like a $100 million conviction, and I've debated some of their people, and they've never come back with fi figures to prove me wrong, so I suspect my numbers are too low. <laughs> Some banks are paying up to 10% for their compliance costs, and, and it's, it's to catch people spreading misinformation, retweeting memes and stuff. They're not even catching the bad guys. It's to go after people that donated to truckers. The U.S., in the back cover of his book, he's got two disks that have the algorithms which are written out in the text. In the back of the book, you have the algorithms, but he also had them on, on, on disk, so you could just drop them in your computer. Well, when we were already in the books, uh, Bruce had called up and talked to one of my associates, and he said to her, you know, if you're going to take these out of the country, you got to take the disk out, because those are considered munitions. The same algorithms were actually in the book. I mean, you just had to scan it and put it back in the computer. But since it was written, that's freedom of speech and protected by the First Amendment. But the disks were considered munitions. And the more I got into this and looked at the whole stupidity of this thing. And so the government's trying to control something you can't control. Now, the software companies who provi provide encryption programs, they've been a big disadvantage because they've had to set up offshore operations to market this. And so much of the encryption programs have moved over to Japan, Switzerland, and Belgium, and Finland, and other places which don't have any restrictions on it. And uh, finally, the administration seems to be beginning to back off on it. But it's much like so many things in Washington, the people are brain dead. It's much like prohibition. I mean, it, 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 prohibition clearly couldn't work because there was a demand for alcoholic beverages. I know that shocks you. But there was a demand for alcoholic beverages. And people knew how to make wine, they knew how to make beer, bathtub gin. I'm not sure I know how to make bathtub gin, but yeah, but, but and I'm a Virginian and we're slow to learn these things. But, but anyway, all this was out, and of course it was ludicrous that if there's a demand, the supply isn't going to be there. And there's a demand for high-level encryption, and people are going to get it, and it's easy because the, the basic fundamentals of how you do public key encryption when there's a demand for something, you can't prohibit it. Technology companies moving overseas to run operations. Does this sound familiar? This is a quote by David Schwartz. The U.S. once heavily restricted the export of cryptography. 
They once heavily restricted the accuracy of GPS. They gave up on these restrictions because of the actual and potential competition with less restricted systems. There will come a time when it isn't they're spying on me through my phone anymore. Eventually it will be my phone is spying on me. Thanks everyone, I hope you enjoyed the show. Please take a moment to like and subscribe. If you enjoy content like this, please consider joining my Patreon. 